98% of policy is decided on a Tuesday in November. Governing is supposed to be hard. So many times I've seen Democrats, like they go to a knife fight and they show up with a freaking 14 point policy plan. Be a different kind of politician. Like believe in this sh Like this is a problem with both deep blue and deep red yeah. states. Yeah. I want to do things. Like I want this place to be better. I really do. Tell me a little bit about why. If you don't believe that, man, it's a damn dire, sour kind of existence. I don't, I don't want to live in that place. I spent 25 years in the firearms industry. They flew jack wagons. They don't, they don't speak for the majority of gun owners. I think in part because of the internet, people live less in the places they live. Yeah. They don't want a weirdo governor in their doctor's office. Good morning, John. Ryan Bussey wants to be my governor. And I, so I thought I'd talk to him about that. Ryan Bussey, hello. Do you want to be my governor? I actually do. It's great to be here. It has been my lifelong goal to be Hank's governor. So. <laughs> Here I am. And I'm going to hold you to that. I don't really want you to represent any of the other citizens of Montana. I have a lot of particular needs yeah. that I need you to take care of for me. It should be known that I think you are the sort of person that needs a personal governor. So here I am. Yeah, auditioning. I, I'm definitely the, the one who needs the most help yeah. in the state. All right. It seems like there's been sort of an influx of Montana politicians who aren't from here who have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's it. Where Democratic Party tends to like put up folks who are from around here, look like they're from around here, uh, have some authentic, credible yeah. credentials. The Republican Party seems to be putting up a lot of folks who, who you know, have been around for a, a while in Montana, but not from here, mm -hmm. and do have a ton of money. Like, what is the? I think wow, one of the do reasons. Do we not have enough people with a ton of money? Yeah. Well, what I like? Think... Could you not have become a billionaire before you did this so you could buy more TV ads? It would have made this a lot easier. And I think actually that smart ass answer is part and parcel to the real answer here. It, it's hard in this environment, in our political system for somebody who doesn't have money to run for office. It's really hard. I wasn't born with money. Uh, my wife and I joke that we married poorly and it's pretty poorly. Um, <laughs> but if you're a billionaire yeah. and you can afford to take time off, if you can yeah. afford to fund your own campaign, and so uh, it's it's easier to run for office, and yeah. it's it's we've created a system where money is sadly pretty damned important, and so that's why we get folks with a lot of money that tend to run. It can be hard work, but it's really invigorating to do these these every one of these events and have people show up and be jacked to to believe in what we're doing. Like that keeps you going, you know. What are people freaked out about right now? Women are freaked out about yeah. privacy and abortion and right to health care, and they should be. We are surrounded by four states, Idaho, Wyoming, both the Dakotas, where a woman's right to privacy and abortion have been drastically curtailed, and some of them very dangerously so. Idaho is a place where women have had to fly out of that state to get medically necessary um, you know, procedures that they would have been prosecuted for. And I don't think it's hyperbole for women to fear that sort of really dangerous handmaid's tale sort of existence and retribution. They're worried about that. Public lands and waters and access is a big, big deal. And then property taxes and, a, and a, just having it be affordable. Yeah. Um, there is this sort of idea in Montana. I think I, I, I call it the Montana struggle, but we're okay. Montanans are okay. They, they get it. This ain't Wall Street. It ain't San Francisco. We didn't move here to make a bajillion dollars. Um, we live here. There's a little bit of a struggle. We try to make it however we can. Um, maybe we're a YouTuber, whatever. But maybe. But we get to live in a place where we can experience things yeah. on the weekends and in our off time, we can go skiing or hiking or whatever. And so we're okay with a little bit of struggle. And this guy and these people have stretched both of those. It's barely right. affordable and the access is reduced and they and people just feel pulled and stretched and they're upset about it. Yeah, I mean, he is a Republican. What was up with raising property taxes? That seems like a thing you should have been able to avoid. They very stupidly, arrogantly raise property taxes on everybody. Um, well, there's a little bit of like, we can do whatever we want I think because we're just going to win. Like this is a problem it, with both like deep blue and deep red yeah, states. Yeah, it, like this, yeah. like I'm not saying this is a Republican problem. Yeah, yeah. We like blue states do this too. Whereas like we can't, like it's not like we're going to lose. What's going to happen? Yeah. Like as long as you hold on to your spot in the primary, you're all good. Well, they're so it feels a little bit like they don't feel like they need to worry. Oh, they did. Anything. They didn't think they had to need. They needed to worry. And Gianforte has four mansions. What's he care if taxes go up a little bit? Like he fly. He, 
He flies his private jet. I mean, he between... obviously likes being governor. Otherwise, he wouldn't be doing it. I think he liked to have governor on his business card. I want to do things. Like, I want this place to be better. I really do. I believe that public education is the backbone of our democracy, and I think it's in peril. I don't think it's right to attack women and freedom like they're doing. I really don't. Public lands and sort of the outdoor lifestyle being, in, to me, some of the ultimate example of freedom is that, you know, outside of Missoula here, not far from where we're sitting right now, you can hike up a hill on public land and go for miles and miles and miles. You could, you could camp up there for months and never see another yeah. person. I mean, if there's anything more free than that, I, I ain't seen it. Um, I mean, you're, you're literally pointing the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're oriented. You were yeah. pointing at the rattlesnake yeah. when you did that. Look at him. Yeah. He knows where he is. Yeah. So I, I, he's I, never been in this room before. I, I think that stuff's important and I think it's all in peril. Um, I get it that the governor has to be on the business card to impact those things, yeah. but I'm running to do the things. I think that Gianforte is probably running to do the things as well. I think that he just, uh, he's, I, th I think that there's a, a lot of folks who think the, that America has gone in really the wrong direction in a way that really scares me because the thing that they think is wrong is that, that gay people can get married, is mm. that women can choose to have an abortion, is that students get taught the history of their nation mm -hmm. in their in their schools mm -hmm. instead of god forbid the propaganda version where everybody was great and mm -hmm. nothing ever went wrong in mm -hmm. the history of america and we only fixed problems mm -hmm. we never created any especially i think that that is the case when when there's a, a mix of fundamentalism in it yeah and no doubt uh and so I, like i think that we're living through the consequences of that yeah. in Montana right now. And so I like, I do appreciate you wanting to do this and wanting to win yeah. and also wanting to have a good time while you're doing it. I have enjoyed hanging out with you in the times yeah. that we've hung out. Yeah. I do love to have fun. Our campaign team has fun. My family always has fun. Even in- It does seem like it would probably not be great for the family, but- It's going to, it's going to, it's going to put a damper on family time and some fun time for sure. Yeah. But you know, sometimes you got to buckle down and get the work done. And I just, I think this place is at a tipping point and we need to, Somebody needs to stand up and fix it. Yeah. yeah. So as you've been going around talking to people, property taxes, we didn't finish that conversation. Mm -hmm. What, why the property taxes? Go up? It's, it's a, it feels, it feels like there was plenty of money there for a while. There's too. over a two and a half billion dollar surplus. They didn't have to raise property taxes. The previous four governors, when they were presented with this same kind of property appraisal thing that was going to crank up taxes, they fixed it. This guy didn't. I think there is this really numbness or, or, or actually kind of ambivalence towards working people. Everything, every chance they had to make it harder on working folks that were two or 3,000 bucks a year is a big, big deal. We're one of only nine states that taxes Social Security. We just put a tax on tips, like right? working people or folks that work their whole life and are retired, right? To people that get tips, like they ain't rolling in dough. And, and this property tax, to a large degree, these taxes went up on folks who have, you know, people on fixed incomes or you know, retired ladies that have had their house paid off for 20 years, they can't mm -hmm. afford a $3,000 property tax increase. Yeah. And they did it anyway. And I don't know why, but I can tell you, um, you know, Rafe and I, my lieutenant governor and I were probably the only two Democrats in the last hundred years that are, or maybe ever, that are two Democrats running against Republicans that have raised people pro people's property taxes. Like we're the low tax Democrats, baby. <laughs> um, it's not a common thing. That's us. And it's an easy thing to fix, and they should have fixed it. And it's is it easy to fix? It is, yeah. It's a political disaster. So it's one number in the state code when they are presented with this problem, right? Appraisals go up, and then the state has a multiplier that they say, okay, we apply this multiplier, and everybody gets taxed this. The budget committee, the budget folks bring you a piece of paper and say, look, if you don't adjust the rate to this, everybody's property taxes are going to go up. And that's why the last four governors are like, Ugh, don't do that. Right. Yeah. Turn that number. It takes 30 minutes. It's one number. It takes 30 minutes in the legislature and they refuse to do it. Well, but there's got to be like an impact on the budget, though. There really wasn't much in, of an impact on the budget. The state didn't need the money. Like it wasn't like the state just went like, wow, this year we need $259 million more. No, they didn't. They didn't need the money. We're going to have almost a $3 billion surplus this next session. This thank you, Thanks to jacking these property taxes up. It was just, it feels like they were just not paying attention then. Or it's, the it's hard to know. Um, because it's so egregious. Because it can't be, it can't have been good for them politically. It's like so people, egregiously stupid. People are probably looking to their 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 county yeah. and thinking it's the county that did it, or they're looking like Gianforte blamed the counties, and it's this whole for oh. those <laughs> who 
People probably live in places where this is not their existence, but we have a Republican governor who then blamed county commissioners said, yo, yo, that's like they realize, oh crap, taxes went up. And he's like, it's the county's fault. And the county commissioners are like, no, 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 dude, we didn't have anything to do with this. Yeah. And then and then he sued the county. The county's like, we're not even going to collect all that tax. You made us jack it up so much. Wild. And the governor sues sure. the counties of the state. It's well, like, no, I'm going to make you collect more tax. I mean, they do have. It is That is the law. And they're Republican <laughs> county commissioners. So you have this Republican infighting. Yeah. We, we go meet with these county commissioners all the time. They're Republicans. And they're like, they can't stand this governor. So this is a very... It's a bad policy thing for the state, but it's an opportunistic political time for us to fix it. Just got to be the same sane adult in the room, yeah. you know, and maybe not believe in stegosauruses going up the uh, ramp to the arc. Um, maybe these things weave together. The Hank that is uh, editing this video here, uh, this is a reference to the fact that Governor Greg Gianforte gave $300,000 to help start a creationist museum in eastern Montana, and that creationist museum does show, it's just the facts. <laughs> does show Noah or some related person to Noah putting a stegosaurus on the ark, which sounds like parody, but they also do have a little sign that says, how'd they get all the dinosaurs on the ark? They used the baby dinosaurs. As it says in the Bible? I don't know. And look, I do think that that is one of the weirder things about Greg Gianforte. It's not a thing that bothers me on its own, but it does seem that his some of his more extreme policy beliefs is tied to his fundamentalism. Anyway, I had to explain that because uh, you don't know that if you don't live in Montana. It's all very national. Like people imagine politics very nationally now, especially maybe people who have recently moved to Montana. We've yeah. got a lot of people who moved yeah. here recently, which is part of the housing crisis that yeah. we have. Uh, and maybe those people don't, they're not aware of state politics very much. and. You know, people align with a party usually. Most mm -hmm. people vote straight ticket. Though in Montana, actually, we have a lot of people who don't do that. We do. You'd be heartened. At these events, I'm telling you, cool cool stuff is happening. Republicans are coming to our events. That's one of the... If there's a good thing about this property tax mess, this debacle, this disaster, it has sort of grabbed Republicans by the collar like, look, this is it's not always a good deal to vote straight ticket, right? And they show yeah. up at our events are like... Because they're whole reality has been shaken. They've been told Republicans are never going to raise their taxes and here this dude raised their taxes. Yeah. And so they're, it's like they've woken up to- And also we're saying no to money. Yeah. You know, like we're saying like there's Medicaid expansion that yeah. we're just saying no to. There's it's like- It's evil and it's bad business. So like I was at the, I was at the um, Billings Clinic talking to the hospital administrators and, and Gianforte likes to present himself as this business genius. And here again, this is where there's bad science coming in here. He kicks everybody, one in eight people off Medicaid, 136,000 people in the state. He kicks off Medicaid. And so a bunch of these folks who are deserving, a lot of them are working people. Some of them are permanently eligible, like, uh, you know, a disabled person in a home or something like mm -hmm. they're permanently eligible. They should never be kicked off. This particular, uh, that the day I was at Billings Clinic, a guy had come in there and he'd been kicked off Medicaid by Gianforte. So he couldn't afford his heart meds anymore for two weeks. Then the day I got there, he had a, a really bad heart attack, bad heart incident, and he was in the ICU. So he went into the emergency room, ends up in the ICU. And somebody, Gianforte, thought it was a good idea to kick him off Medicaid. So wh what did that heart yeah. med cost? 40 bucks? I don't know. What's what's like 10 minutes in the ICU cost? A, a yeah. million? I don't know. It's bad business. And we, the whole state is paying for him in the ICU. And so it's bad business, but it's evil to do it to him. Why yeah. did we do that to that guy? Yeah. And there's 136,000 of like, those people. That's a guy. Yeah, it's like that, a guy that is a human. Life. Right. That's a human that, heart, it's heart med. Give him the medicine. But yeah. Gianforte, when asked about this whole thing, said, yep, yeah, it's working as intended. Really? I thought it was a basic understood thing that responsible citizens in the United States establish a government and these programs to make life better for people. Like, of course there are limits. I don't want onerous, ineffective government. Speaking of. Why is housing so expensive? Part of it's supply. Um, yes, part of it's moving here. Part of it's in inflationary pressures on all things building, labor, materials, concrete, wood, everything, all of that. And part of it is a lack of ingenuity and imagination on all of our parts um, yeah. for not seeing it coming. So I think it's a complex thing. Do you think government could be doing, like state government could be doing more about that? You can't have really vibrant communities or really functioning communities when the people who make them go can't afford to live there. And in many places in Montana and across the country, nurses and mechanics 
and cops and firefighters and school teachers. And that, I mean, the people that make a town or a community or a city go can't afford to live there. That's not a community. You know, I mean, maybe it's like a VRBO vacation rental, but it ain't a community. And I think the state should be using creatively some of its dollars to do things. There's a really good development outside of Bozeman where philanthropy came in and partnered with a developer and they put 64 homes on this little eight acres and they got some rules changed and the, the homes are really modern. And half the homes are sold at half of market value, half. And then people in the community get to apply to buy those and preference is given to like school teachers and cops and firefighters, you know, those sorts of folks. And there are 1,200 people that applied for 30 homes. And I think the state ought to be facilitating creative things like that to make, you know, to make these communities livable for folks. We got to build. We got to be building things. Yeah. There's space. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of space you'd rather not have turned into homes, obviously. Yeah. But there's space for this. Yeah. Gianforte, that's another thing they did. Picking on you live in Missoula. We're here in Missoula today. But um, he really doesn't want local um, towns um, governments, counties making decisions about this. So they really rolled back local huh. control. There were several bills in the last legislative session that really kind of aimed at Missoula. Um, we don't want those Missoulaites doing something that's not approved by the state, you know? So um, I think I think communities, they can be creative and come up, never going to be perfect. And there's a, a tug and a pull, you know, sure. between forces in a town, but communities can figure out what to do. We also got a lot of land in Montana for other stuff. Uh, I think that this year it's projected we'll we'll build about thirty seven like nuclear power plants worth of solar in America. Mm -hmm. That transition is exciting because we need to do it. Do you, you think about how Montana can play a part in that? I'm a big fan of small scale nuclear. I think we have to do that for base level energy. And I think, yeah. you know, on we got to put our we got to put our foot down on the pedal on renewables and be smart about it and keep. Sorry, but science needs to be woven into the way we develop more efficient solar panels all the time. Yeah. Um, and storage devices got to get better. I mean, the reason solar is not the answer to everything because we don't have a way to store that power. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to store it all winter in Montana yeah. either. It, it, like, it, that's just not on the table. But I mean, nuclear is. Yeah. And uh, so how, is that a thing that people think about in Montana? They really are. So we have the coal strip plant, big sure, yeah. coal fire um, powered plant and coal mine um, in eastern Montana, northeast or southeastern Montana. All the infrastructure is there for nuclear. Why? Because there's been a big, there is a big coal powered, coal powered uh, yeah. power plant there. So, so they got all the wires coming in. Every, they got the, the rails are there. Yeah. The, the all the transmission lines are there. Like yeah. if you build a small scale nuclear plant there. You don't have to like do all reinvent that. all this other stuff. It yeah. kind of plugs in. Yeah. It's a good place to put it. You know? It also frees people out and maybe a little less when they're already like, this isn't a new use. Yeah. This thing is already here. Yeah. It's setting the footprints there again. Well, and also like coal is becoming less competitive yeah. economically with gas particularly, but also with wind and solar. Yeah. And so I don't know the extent to which the people in that community kind of see that that's not a permanent, like I'm sure it's a, a, the coal strip plant is a huge and the mine there is a huge deal economically in that area. And so yes, you have to be understand. looking to like what's going to be happening 40 years from now. I've toured it, talked to the folks that work there. Um, change is coming. Whether we think it's a good idea, whether we like it or not, change is coming. And the economics of coal are changing rapidly. Um, climate change is real and it's impacting us all. And so these changes are coming. I think smart people will get out in front of this. And I think we have to put working people at the middle and, the, you know, the very center of that. Yeah. Um, we should be very careful not to castigate folks who, um, you know. Power they, this country. Yeah, they have poured their whole life into this. Yeah. And we ought to make make sure that working people are at the, at the very center of, like, building a new nuclear plant down there. Um, those sorts of things. Yeah. Seems like the kind of thing the government should do. <laughs> there, there you go again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. sorry. There are times in this world where it probably feels to people, you can be pretty dispirited. You can yeah. get down about politics. You can think, you know, but you have to be optimistic. When you're doing this political stuff, you got to be optimistic that good things can come of government action, that good things can come of elections, that good things can come of science, that good things can come of government. Um, if you don't believe that, man, it's a damn dire, sour kind of existence. I don't, I don't want to live in that place. <laughs> I also don't think we do. Yeah, I get that. It, that like things can be awful sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that you hear stories like, "What have, have you been hearing 
What's like the hardest thing you've heard on the trail? Oh, you know, to hear, to be with our native partners and native leaders. I was on the Blackfeet Reservation a couple of days ago and to hear some of the dispiriting stories about um, inequity of our justice system, to hear dispiriting stories about the ways in which um, drugs or addiction have ravaged native communities. Um, it's pretty rough. Mm -hmm. It's pretty rough. Uh, to hear stories, we just filmed one yesterday of women who um, have had to endure um, all sorts of, you know, um, abortion and reproductive rights and um, threats to that, and are and are and are scared and are worried. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's tough to see that fear in people's eyes. Um, but in both of those cases, I'm like, like this is you don't have to be Einstein to make either one of those better. Like those are simple. It's heartening to me, I guess, and hopeful to say look, that that can be made better. Women's rights, abortion, healthcare, privacy, that can be made better. Um, so at, at the same time, when it's dark and hard and yeah. folks are telling you their gut wrenching stories, it's still hopeful because you can you can you can see a way out of that. What messages are working against you? I'm sure that you think about this. You're a politician running for office. Uh, you're paying attention to what people are saying about you is there, is anything sticking like what do people hate about ryan bussey <laughs> so i don't um i knew what they would say right i called i worked for 25 years in the gun industry and i still believe in gun in responsibility and so um i've written quite a bit i wrote a book about my life my memoir and i attack irresponsible actions that the industry and some individuals in and around the gun world have done and propagated on our political system. You still have friends in that world? You worked I have time. some, but I've lost a lot because it's uh it's a pretty you know, it's it's a <laughs> it's a pretty polarized place. And sure. so most of the folks who I you know, I was close personal friends with a lot of people. Um I'd went to their weddings and been to the funerals of their parents and were around when their kids were born and by and large they none of them talk to me anymore because I dare criticize, you know, the right side of politics. But mm -hmm. um so what the what the you know the hits on me are oh gosh I'm in some way I'm some you know they 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 want to say that I'm some communist gun grabber right um, meanwhile I hunt and shoot with my kids all the time and I own lots of guns and I've sold three million of them that doesn't really stick I think it's telling the only thing they've done is run negative on me uh, there's no ad like oh Greg Gianforte is a great guy and he loves Stegosauruses like they haven't run that one. <laughs> Um, do you feel no, like do you feel like their attacks on you uh, have any honest like have honesty to them or have no that like no. you don't because like you don't like the gun industry I'm still proud of owning guns I love to hunt and shoot um, lots of people in Montana do so I am and not embarrassed about that in the least but I'm I also believe that as a responsible citizen a freedom that powerful has to be balanced with responsibility has to be and I view me. And what I'm standing up for is the real pro-gun person. You don't want to, if you're going to jeopardize your rights, um, jeopardize the rights of everybody to make some weird machismo political symbol by scaring kids or looking the other way when bad things happen, that doesn't protect anything. Like I'm the one that's protecting people's gun rights. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm at peace with that. I mean, I, I agree with you. And yeah. I also think that there is a certain amount of the way that this conversation has happened has largely been fueled by people wanting to make it bad. Yeah. Like they want to make it scary. They want to like they they Oh, want... there are people marketing now. There are gun companies marketing now to civil war. They're yeah. marketing in ways that they present they present scenarios that it would be cool to kill your neighbor, right? Right. In some violent insurrection. It is. Well, there it is are people a weird that want it set of fantasies. Yeah. But I think what people should know about gun owners is the vast majority of them are responsible and decent. These loud jack wagons, they don't they don't speak for the majority of gun owners. And it's a lot like the politics of the right. I, th I still think there's decent, responsible people who consider themselves conservative. These loud, mic'd up, you know, social media warriors, they're not, yeah. they, they don't represent most folks. It's the thing, you gotta get the energy. You know, I feel like that, like I make stuff on the internet and I know, I know what's gonna work. Yeah. I wanna get views on a, on yeah. a tweet, if I want to get views on a video, yeah. I know the easiest way to do that is to make the scariest video yeah. and the one that's going to freak people out the most. Yeah. And if you don't feel like you have any responsibility to 
not do that. Do you even feel like you have a responsibility to like the social order? Yeah. To people's like ability to function inside of society or the society's ability to function. Yeah. Your primary goal is just to get eyeballs on you. Yeah. That's what you got to do. You got to get people scared. You know, as you know, there's there are triggers inside of the human body that respond exceptionally quickly and sure. very well to fear. Uh-huh. Um, and it's easy to get people ginned up over that stuff. So. Yeah. Montana is where we live. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would think, uh, well, there's that's not much use running as a Democrat in Montana. You say, I don't know what the swing is for Trump uh, in the state, plus 20, yeah, something like that. Yeah, somewhere between 10 and 20. We'll yeah. see. National ticket now has got some excitement behind it, so we'll see. We'll see. But remember, Obama only lost his state by about three and a half, four points. That's so, wild. Yeah. You've decided to do this, though. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about why. Well, the motto of our campaign is get your Montana back. And uh, folks do, they think now that Montana's a red state. That's not really what, this is a really unique live and let live place, egalitarian kind of purple, small D democratic place. And it's a magic place, as you know, Hank, you live yeah. there. There is, um, there is this take care of each other. It's a place where we help each other instead of hate each other. It's a place of magical access to public lands, really good public education. All of these forces that equalize people in a way where we don't pull rank on each other. Sure. You know, you can walk. Unless in. you have a lot of Twitter followers. If you have a lot of Twitter followers, mm-hmm. you, you're you uh, entitled to pull rank and have your own governor, uh, which is why I'm here. I want to be very clear about that. Uh, but Gianforte, the guy who is our governor now, Republican yeah. governor, he's attacking the very foundational systems that have made Montana what it is. Uh, Montanans rewrote their constitution in 1972. It's a magic for any, I know there's probably not a lot of geeks that sit around, you know, reading state constitutions. We got you, a good one. You got to go read the preamble to the Montana Constitution. And then just a few things, rights in there that folks across the country would love to have. We have an enumerated right to privacy. We have an enumerated right to an equal public education. We have an enumerated right to know. It says our government must tell us what's going on, public records, those sorts of things. And we have the right to a clean and healthful environment. It's written into our Constitution. That document and the systems that have flowed from that have made this a place where we don't pull rank on each other. Mm-hmm. Folks here, they walk into a bar and you don't. it doesn't matter how much money you have or who your dad is or what your pedigree is, or you don't have to be a prince to do this. Like we all treat each other equally. And that whole thing is under attack by this guy who wants to commercialize everything, sell off public access, attack public education, really attack women's rights, the right to health care, the right to an abortion, um, enshrined by our right to privacy in our constitution. And so when we say get our Montana back, we mean we want to repair and restore and strengthen the institutions and systems that have given us this state. And this guy is jeopardizing them. Well, I mean, there's kind of this this vibe of like people want to be in charge of government, even though they hate government. Like I'll fix what I imagine the problems to be, which is more about what you imagine the problems to be than it is about what the problems actually are. You're dead it's, nuts, right, man. So you end up creating a lot of dysfunction yeah. in the government, which it feels like that has been the story of the last few I years. I mean, Greg Gianforte is an arsonist who got hired to run the fire station, right? He, he hates the idea of effective government. He got hired or elected in a really weird tumultuous year, sure. 2020, yeah. right? He's just at the right place with money in a time when, you know, COVID and George Floyd and Portland, and, like there was so much stuff happening in our society. There was this reaction and Gianforte gets elected. But he hates government. DPHHS, which is our agency here in Montana, that's a Department of Health and Human Services, right? It helps folks stay on um, Medicaid, um, make sure that, you know, vulnerable populations have good services and coverage. And he's taken that apart. He kicked one in eight Montanans off their coverage. Uh, he's attacking public access. He wants to privatize our public schools. He was, he's already marching down that path. I recognize that I live in a state where a lot of my neighbors don't have the same political perspectives as me. Mm-hmm. Like we have different worldviews sometimes. We yeah. want different things yeah. for our kids sometimes. Mostly we want the same things. Yeah. They're, like there's the bizarre stuff over here, but there's also just like a an extreme view of how America should be that I don't actually think aligns with even the people who I disagree with about stuff. Yeah. It doesn't really align with what they want either. Oh no. Like no. rewriting the constitution. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That that most folks in this state, they they want to live in this place that we've described. Yeah. Um, where their kids are equal and they walk into school. 
and where you can be a carpenter or a nurse or a school teacher and yeah. still have the same public access on waters that the bajillionaire guy who lives mm -hmm. up the road in a bajillionaire ranch does, right? right? That's a cool thing. Not to Gianforte, it's not cool. He's got four mansions and he's the only governor to ever sue to block public river access. But um, it's cool to do the rest of that in of Montana? Us. What's that? Do you do that in yeah, Montana? Yeah, I did in Montana, East Gallatin. He How would it. you even do that? It's yeah. Montana. Yeah, well, that's what I think. I would be pissed off if that was Texas, but it's Montana. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, we just have like sort of legendarily open river access laws. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. public river ac stream access law, we call it. It's another magic thing about Montana where we say, no, you don't have to. Yeah. It's sort of an anti, you know, feudal European kind of uh -huh. like thumb our nose. No, you don't have to be a prince. You don't have to be a king. Like you get yeah. to access the river just like it's everybody the river. else. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool thing. I love a river, man. It's tough not to like a river. It's, <laughs> a, cal it's a calming thing. Yeah. You probably needed a lot of rivers lately. I haven't been on enough rivers, although I will tell you the uh, our campaign, like we say, we only have a couple rules, have fun and win. I'm not sure which is more important depending on the day, but I think it's win. But the one thing we did really fun together was we had a day on the river rafting yeah. and, you know, God, we're jumping off of cliffs and, you know, swimming around with our cowboy hats on and falling off the raft. It's, you know, it's a fun time. It's a good time. The thing that I, I like to try and keep in touch with is how lucky we are to live in this country, to live in this state. Yeah to have uh to have these people that we get to share it with yeah like it's pretty remarkable to be on this planet like what a good planet but it's a I've, mess sometimes i've not yet found a better one i've been looking and they all seem to have i mean we've got climate problems but a lot of those have really bad climate problems <laughs> but not to say that we don't need to take care of it yeah. but also i'm glad it's not mars i mean or also i mean venus looks cool but it's freaking hot up. i mean you talk no. about here it's hot up there yeah yeah. It's uh, talk about a runaway greenhouse effect. Yeah. Wait until the lead is melting yeah. on the surface of the yeah. planet. Yeah. Um, they now, I mean, the folks on Venus, they at least admit climate change is real up there. <laughs> they uh, have had a hard go of it lately yeah. for the last few billion years. Um, one of the things that I, I feel like is not well aligned with our current government and the people of Montana appears, according to polling anyway, to be abortion access and reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. uh, that we have a ballot initiative this year. Yeah. Uh, it seems to be polling well. Yeah. But but Gianforte is like not shy no. about wanting to get rid of all abortions. In so the state. he's one of these folks who has this weird and dangerous fascination with controlling women. Folks in this state really do value, even though it's like a so kind of traditionally conservative social place. Yeah. Like folks do just sort of mind their own business, and, business but they yeah. don't want a weirdo governor in their doctor's office telling them what they can and can't do with yeah. their most intimate decisions. You know, yeah. this ab abortion initiative, I-128, polls at 65 to 70%. That means the vast majority of Republicans agree. It may be to do that some folks are very supportive of abortion. And it may be that some folks supportive or not, they just don't want to be told what to do. They don't, right. they don't like the thought of their daughter you know, enduring some horrible thing and being told that she has to carry a pregnancy to term. Or, you know, a, a woman has some pregnancy complication and is forced to fly out of state to yeah. save her life, which we've seen in surrounding states. This guy is badly out of step with the with the people of the state. And I think he's about ready to find out how badly out of step he is. But he signed five restrictive abortion bills, promises to sign more. That was his quote. I promise to sign more. Um, he signed Senate Bill 154. That's a bill that promises to strip the right to privacy from our constitution. And that's that's the right that enshrines our gotcha. right over yeah. bodily autonomy. So yeah, he's he's out of step. Yeah. I mean, what a thing to to think we have to go all the way to changing the constitution in order to get this one thing done. Yeah. How do you break folks out of thinking about national all the time? I just I think that like I don't know if if, I, if we need to do that, but like it's just I think in part because of the internet. People live less in the places they live yeah. and they live more yeah. in the country broadly. I think it can be hard. It's, a, it's you know, it can be taxing to yeah. pay attention to local politics. There's a lot going on. I don't know if you want to like care about like where they're putting the sewer or if you want to care about, you know, like that's there's like you can go as deep as you want. Yeah. But is there a way to break out of it? Because I like I, I as much as I'm like happy to see all of the energy around uh, go, the, the top of the ticket, I feel like there's not as much conversation going 
to local politics. I think that that means that local races are underfunded. Oh, that's uh, true. Yeah. And I, I, and also like maybe you don't even know when you walk into the voting booth. And so you end up voting straight ticket, mm -hmm. even if that wouldn't be kind of reflective partisanship. That's sure. the way we got here. I, so I think I believed this from the beginning when it got in the race. I think it's really incumbent on somebody like me to sort of change the definition of what a Western Democrat is and to surprise people and to not fit into these sort of pre-made boxes that folks have been told, oh, look out for a Democrat. He's going to look like this and talk like this. Um, and so the, our style, our sort of direct way of communicating, um, we don't believe in like pre-made perfect teleprompter statements like the way we're communicating here right now is the way you don't that, even know that there's a mic there exactly just i'm just like waving it. around like i like, right like something's in my way i just punch it um <laughs> like this is us um and i think people find that refreshing and and a lot of folks a lot of republicans they 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 gravitate to us because we believe what we say i think i, I preach to my campaign team of a lot about this but i think for a lot of politicians and i put a lot of democrats in this box our actions have not matched our rhetoric for a long time. Like we say we care about this. We say we care about that, but we don't govern like it. We don't campaign like it. We don't fight like it. We don't talk like it. You know, we don't convince and argue like it. Um, and I think it's really important that if, if we want voters to believe us and kind of shake them out of this like national malaise and anger, um, then be a different kind of politician. Like believe in this, shit. like fight <laughs> for it, convince people. If, Say the words you believe. Be convinced yourself. Be convinced enough that you can conv convince other people. And I think that's powerful. I think the hard part often comes when you maybe know a little bit more than your constituents do yeah. about like what it takes to get things done. And so you say, here's what we're going to do, even though you know it's probably not going to be able to do all of that because mm -hmm. we have to deal with this city council here and this county commissioner here and, and the legislature and et cetera. And it's hard. Like governing is supposed to be hard. To some extent, like we don't want it to be easy for somebody to come in and change everything and break everything. We want to be able to weather a bad leader. Let's Democrats talk about have forgot. Right. I, I really and, and lots of I think people and voters have forgot. Ninety eight percent of policy is decided on a Tuesday in November. Right. If the most important thing you can do to begin with is win the election. And I think it to your point about things that are complex and speaking to voters and over promising. Boil down your message to the essence, right? Get down to what's important. Say it simply. Don't put, like, so many times I've seen Democrats, like they go to a knife fight and they show up with a freaking 14 point policy plan. Like you're you're going to lose that, right? Yeah. Win the election. <laughs> it's cha I mean, it's changed a lot and, and like it's taken a little bit of time for yeah. the the apparatuses to change around it. Yeah. You know, like it used to be you show up with a 14 point policy plan. Yeah. It used to be you got judged on that more. Yeah. And right now, the conversation is, it, you know, it's, it can be more about vibes, but because the vibes are important right now. Yeah. Like we have a party led by a guy who has never accepted the outcome of an election he lost. And he appears to be preparing everybody for if he doesn't win this one, he will also not accept that. The two parties, and I'll take me and Greg Gianforte, we are radically... <laughs> different people. We see the world in radically different ways. I want government to do good things for people. I want people to have freedoms. I don't want women to be subjugated. I want access to our public lands. And I don't want every single thing in this state commercialized so that working people can't access them. Greg Gianforte believes almost exactly the opposite of every single one of those things. And so I don't need like minutia, 14 point policy plans. Right. I can boil down our message to very simple things because our differences are wide. Our goal between our our two mm. campaigns is wide. Whatever my worldview is, it's like to allow people to have their worldviews, to mm. like to be free, not not to impose some sort of weird religious zealotry on women or you know gay kids or whatever it is. I I just don't believe that's my place. Or and I don't think that most Montanans are down with that. Even conservative, I think of all these folks I hunt and fish on their ranches, and they're good, you know, hardy like right connected to the earth folks and they're not down with like hating a gay kid or worried about what some book somebody's reading or like who loves who they don't give a shit about that um they just want to live their lives and be good folks uh and that's like that's the montana i want to get back to 
What do you wish people knew about Montana? I mean, I see a lot of, we got a, a fair set of portrayals in the media, uh, but I don't know that they're always 100% there. Yeah. What do you, what do you wish? Because, and also, you know, sometimes like the main thing people know about Montana is that our governor body slammed a reporter. Yeah. The things that people think about and the reason they film TV shows here and everything else, yeah, it's a beautiful place. We all know that. We got Yellowstone Park. We got Glacier Park. We got beautiful rivers. We got a river running through uh, Missoula right here, right? Um, we got these big mountains around. It's an awesome place. But the people in the institutions of Montana are equally special. We hit on a little bit the 1972 Constitution. The fact that um, the framers of that Constitution, a hundred common people brought together in 1972, they set themselves alphabetically, hmm. not by party, alphabetically. The one requirement was that you could not be an elected official. Hmm. Um, and some folks may know my two boys were in the held climate case, the um, very, very famous climate case where 16 kids sued the state of Montana for violating the right to a clean and healthful environment. And during that trial, one of the coolest things I can imagine happened, and it's a really a, a cool Montana story. Um, unlike most constitutional cases across the country where we generally argue about what these mythical, mostly men from 248 years ago thought like, mm -hmm. what did Jefferson think? And, you know, they're always arguing about what the framers thought. In Montana, our constitution was written in 72 and we still have nine living framers of that constitution. And the one, the article nine, the right to a clean and healthful environment, it was written by the time by a gal named Maynan Ellingson. She was 24 years old at the time. And she's a rock star attorney now. She lives in Missoula. She's obviously still living and she's she's very vibrant and smart. And um, the very first witness in that case, unlike all these other constitutional cases in the country, right? <laughs> like, the, it's like, the, what did you intend? The attorneys basically, we don't know. Said, like, the attorneys what is... basically said like this, you know, this is not going to be the average constitutional case where we sit around wondering about what the framers thought. Why? Because right here we have a framer and in walks main Ann. That's and why she sits down and for two hours, they grilled her like, did you mean this? Did you mean that? What did you, who <laughs> debated this? Who debated? And she remembered it all, right? Yeah. And she said, we wrote this constitution for a time like this. We debated all of this. We knew this stuff was coming down. Mm -hmm. Yes, this article nine was written for this. So after that, nobody could say like, oh, I don't know what the framers thought. Bullshit. She's right yeah. there. One of the great things about Montana that I have really liked since living here is that it does not make political sense if you think about it through a national lens. Yeah. It's like, why does this very red state have such strong labor laws? And it's like, oh, because in, in that way, it's not a red state. Like it is yeah. a Butte America state. Exactly. It is a mining in state. In many is... ways, organized labor in the United yeah. States, certainly in the Western US, was born in this we, place. The, the history of yeah. the labor movement in yeah. Montana is not pretty. It's, it is. It's it's not it's, it's beautiful it's beautiful but it's not, it's pretty, not right? pretty i mean there were people who lost their lives there were people who were subjugated horribly the copper kings ran around literally buying elections passing out hundred dollar yeah. bills they owned right? the newspapers yeah. yeah you know yeah you you've heard of you know people who fly into las vegas see the name clark everywhere that's william clark that was that guy was a copper king here in montana mm -hmm. and so much of what yeah. we have in this state to your point is a reaction against these abusive billionaires who care nothing about the freedoms of people. And so that's why this love of freedom and labor and equalization yeah. and common folks, common folks having um, equal access to all these things, schools yeah. and rivers and everything else. It is a reaction against a time when it was very badly abused. Yeah. And that's a cool kind of fabric about Montana. I don't want it to make sense nationally. Yeah. I want there to be places that are diverse in that way. Yeah. I kind of think all of that is on the ballot here. I think you have I think Gianforte and Sheehy and Danes and these folks who you, who you mentioned are trying to make it into this monolithic national place where just like red yeah. Republicans, everybody vote this way and you don't need to worry about anything else. And Montana has always kind of given its finger to that. Oh, yeah. Watch us, you know. Um, yeah. And I hope we do that again uh, because so many magic things, really cool, important egalitarian principle type things are on the line. We put in place these institutions that equalize everybody. And if we start to to tear at those institutions, that wonderful non-judgmental, non-pulling rank on each other will go away. That'll be a sad, sad thing. There's something maybe nice about a governor race where there's a little bit, maybe a little bit less animosity. I don't know how much of that you're catching. Like how 
Like national animals? How much do people, well, I mean, it, no, I mean, like people you deal with, like how much do you have to worry about the people in your community in Kalispell being like, ah, oh, I hate this man because he is, he is now representing everything that I've been told to be afraid of about there, Democrats. There's always a little national politics that leaks in everywhere. And, you know, the folks that are just diehard true believers are never going to be converted. They're going to hate the Democrat and the Democrat's going to dislike the Republican. I get that. Yeah. That's not what we're encountering on the, on the, yeah. on the, it's really not nice folks. And I, and the reason is it comes back to this place. People care about the place enough to kind of let their national politics at least at least pause them while they come to our rally or when they mm -hmm. talk to us. Like, I rarely do I meet somebody who says, you know, you know, I want to shred our, our public lands access. Even far right people, they want to protect that. So we have this common set of values. And I think if, if we're going to kind of rescue a democracy that works, I sort of view this as like this sort of outpost lab, you know, like we're, we got this democracy experiment going on out here and maybe we'll like grow some seeds and then if it dies in other places, we'll go reseed these places. I kind of view Montana like that. What's next? What are you doing? We have an event here in Missoula tonight, and we're about 70 days out from the election. And that means we're like full tilt boogeyman. When is it? Like, because it, a lot like most people vote absentee. Yeah. Right so here. in about 50 days, 45, 50 days, most people, about 80% of the people in Montana vote by mail by absentee. Yeah. And so those, um, those ballots show up in about 50 days. So, um, you know, it's we've been campaigning now for about 335, 340 days. And um, how's your vehicle? Um, we have put many miles. I think just me, I'm I'm probably clicked over 80,000 miles this week. It's a big you can drive for 11 hours and never leave the state. You know, you can't fly to Miles City. No, unless you're Greg Gianforte. Unless you're Greg Gianforte. Yeah, you could just take one of your. Planes. God, man, it'd be nice to have a plane right now. Yeah. You get any you get any private flights out of your donors? Anybody have, loaning you a plane? I have never been. So Greg Gianforte has body slammed a reporter. I've never done that. Yet? Oh, not yet. Um, the day ain't over, but right. So <laughs> Greg Gianforte flies around on his private jet. I've never been on a private jet. Um, that's another thing I've never done. Yeah. I would get body slammed by you, but only mm -hmm. because I, it's been a long time since I've been body slammed and I'd like mm -hmm. to see how I'd handle it. Um, also, if I don't know if it would help or not. Do you think we could sell tickets? I see where you straight go, monetize everything, just like Greg Gianforte. I'm trying to think how this goes over. Um, gubernatorial candidate body slams Hank Green. I don't know. I just don't see the headline helping me. I've, I, you know, it's all earned media at this point. <laughs> <laughs> like what's, <is> that what? <laughs> I, I think maybe I'll take it under advisement yeah. and lay off for now. It's hard to get earned media. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you Thanks coming for doing this, man. office and yeah, hanging out. This is pretty cool. Yes. So I will tell you, uh, he has refused to debate us. Oh yeah, he, yeah. Today he said he refused to debate us. He's just like not gonna do it. Just... That's what he says. Like he goes, but well, first off, we're a campaign that just outraised him, outraised his campaign. He says, yeah, they're not a credible campaign. <laughs> oh really? Well, we just outraged you. <laughs> um, and he says, well, this guy won't release his tax returns. I'm like, I didn't even think about. It. But he, I won't debate him until he releases his tax returns. I don't know. Apparently they think I, I, I got a bunch of stuff to hide. I, I guess I don't. Is I wish I, you declared a home office. I wish I had, it was actually the I kitchen. Wish I had and like it's like 50 50. To hide. Yeah. I have no such vast wealth. And so we're going to release our taxes here Tuesday. Yeah. And, and he's going to be pigeonholed into like, okay, I guess I, guess I, I to... got to debate him. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Ryan Bussey for coming out and talking with me. Thanks to Hiroka and Madison for helping to set it up in here so I could be a podcaster for a day. I wanted to do this because I think we are a little bit too stuck in thinking of everything in a national lens. And I know that we are all sort of like living a national experience, especially those of us who spend a lot of time on the internet. But the things that are happening at the state and local level matter a huge amount, and they are every bit as important a reason to vote as the top of the ticket, as they say. I got some great people that I'm voting for here in Montana, and you probably have some great folks that you can vote for wherever you are as well. Those of you who are not in America, apologies. Uh, how the heck did you get all the way through that? I hope that it was interesting. John, I'll see you on Tuesday.